Some say history is a river that flows endlessly. I say that history is a series of stories written by each person's experiences. Welcome to Stories, a history of Appalachia, one story at a time. Well, Rod, this week we're going to be talking about the filibusters. Now, do you know what a filibuster happens to be? You know, that sounds very familiar to me. You know, and I think there is a presidential candidate running right now that tried a filibuster here maybe a year or two ago by reading Dr. Seuss. Well, Am I correct about that? That is correct, but it's not the kind of filibuster that I'm talking about. Okay, good. Well, let's hear it. Um, you know, words get misconstrued over time, so let's find out what this is all about. Well, let's travel back to 1850s America, where a filibuster happened to be a person who wanted to expand the U.S. influence over Latin America, you know, manifest destiny and all that. Yeah, right. And the filibusters, there were several of them. They, The interest that they had was to expand slavery for the most part. Or, yeah, particularly, you know, in the South, if you Mm -hmm. were in the North, they just wanted to expand American power and influence throughout the world. American imperialism, if we Mm -hmm. want to say. Now, the most famous filibuster from the 1850s was a fellow by the name of William Walker. And, Rod, if you ever go down to Nicaragua, don't speak the name William Walker out loud because he is not very well liked in that area. Hmm. Well, I've got a feeling I'm going to find out why, and you're going to tell us, so let's fire on ahead. I am indeed. William Walker was born in Tennessee in 1820 to a Scots father and a Virginia mother. And Mr. Walker ended up with both a medical degree and a law degree. He started out his adult life as a doctor through his medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania. He then got tired of that and decided to be a newspaper man. Down in New Orleans, he edited the New Orleans Crescent and finally started to practice law. But in amongst all these different professions he had, Rod, William Walker was a world wanderer. He traveled to Europe, particularly during the time of the revolutions in Europe in the 1840s, 1848. So he got influenced by the communes. He got influenced by the revolutions in Germany and Italy during that period of time. That changed him from just a good old Tennessee boy into someone who was wanting to spread the U.S. influence over Latin America, i.e. a filibuster. And boy, he was the filibuster. In 1853, Mr. Walker gathered a group of people from Tennessee and Kentucky and decided, you know, we're going to invade Mexico in Baja, California. And they did. And they set up the Republic of Lower California and then adopted the laws of the state of Louisiana and introduced slavery to wow. Baja, California. The Mexican army didn't much care for that. Mm-hmm. And he barely made it out of Mexico with his life, came back to the U.S. But that did not stop him because in 1855, and here's where he's most famous, he took those same forces and decided to go to Nicaragua. During the 1830s and 40s, Nicaragua was suffering repeated civil wars. They had two factions down there. They had the liberals and the conservatives. The liberals happened to lead the city of Leon in Nicaragua. The conservatives led the city of Granada, and they just fought wars back and forth with each other ever since independence 20 years before. Well, Walker came in, actually was brought in as a mercenary on the side of the liberals in Lyon through a mercenary contract negotiated by one of his friends, a fellow by the name of Byron Cole. Now, why did he do all this? At the time, there was no Panama Canal. Mm -hmm. Also at this time, we had something in California called the Gold Rush that had been going Mm -hmm. on for a few years. Lots of people wanting to settle in California, and you had two ways to get there. You either, well, three ways. You either got in a wagon, you went through Indian country with the dangers of being attacked by Indians over a long period of time, all the way through the desert and then into California. You got on a ship and you sailed around South America and came up to the coast in California, 
or the more popular way, you sailed to Nicaragua on the Atlantic coast, crossed over, got on a ship on the Pacific coast, and sailed up to California. Hmm. Who owned all this transit property? Probably, you know, would the name Vanderbilt have anything to do with this? Yes, indeed. Cornelius right. Vanderbilt, also known as Commodore Vanderbilt. He had established something called the Accessory Transit Company. That spanned Nicaragua, connected uh, steamships and riverboats and wagons, stagecoach wagons, from the Atlantic port of Greytown up the San Juan River to Lake Nicaragua, then from the lake's western shore, a 12-mile carriage road to the Pacific port of San Juan del Sur. Accessory transit carried tens of thousands of passengers every year, which made Nicaragua a strategic priority for the federal government of the United States. In fact, President James Buchanan later said, quote, to the U.S., these routes are of incalculable importance as a means of communication between their Atlantic and Pacific possessions. So there was some incentive there for Walker to get down there and take control of things. You know, when I when you started telling me this, immediately the theme to the A-team popped into my head because <laughs> it's like they were soldiers of fortune. And if you want to hire them, maybe you can hire the Walker team is what you could call them because that's pretty much what they did. They just went in where, where there was trouble and they solved the trouble, or at least they tried to solve the trouble. Well, Walker was a bit more ambitious, though, okay. than these folks. On May 4th, 1855, he and his small crew, not the whole crew, but the small crew, left San Francisco in a ship called the Vesta, 57 followers. On arrival, he demanded an independent command from the liberal Nicaraguans. They agreed to do that. He then decided to launch a frontal attack that almost ended things and almost cost him his life. Uh, the liberal leader in general then died, and even though he screwed up with this first attack, Walker became the senior officer. He commandeered a steamboat, landed in the rear of Granada, and captured the city, and took hostage the families of the conservative leaders, and they agreed to terms. In other words, he conquered the conservatives and conquered mm -hmm. Nicaragua. Walker then created a unity provisional government and set up a... Well, I guess you'd call him a front man. Patricio Rivas as president. Kept himself as commander of the army. Uh, Rivas was a weak leader. Walker had the conservative leader tried and executed and became the strong man for Nicaragua. Wow. Problems arose, though, because all the other little countries in Latin America who had been seeing these filibusters come around to different countries, Cuba, Honduras, etc., we got a little alarmed because Walker was more successful than any of them had been, so they prepared for war. And the Nicaraguans were not going to fight for Walker. So Walker then sends out a call for more Americans to come fight. And the only way they could get there, though, Rod, was on the Accessory Transit Company's uh, steamships, which were owned by Commodore Vanderbilt, and Commodore Vanderbilt didn't want anything to do with any of this because it was getting out of hand. Mm-hmm. So a little intrigue sets in. Does the name Edmund Randolph mean anything to you? Yes, it does. He was an attorney in San Francisco, but wasn't he also a descendant of, the, of a governor of Virginia? Yeah, the first Edmund Randolph. Not mm -hmm. only governor, he was the Virginia representative to the Constitutional Convention back in the ah. 1780s. Yeah. Okay. Well, Randolph visited Cornelius K. Garrison, and that man was Accessory Transit's agent in the city of San Francisco, Randolph explained his plan to get Walker to revoke the company charter in Nicaragua and grant it to him so that he could then flip it and sell it to Garrison and thus gain some kind of control over this company from Cornelius Vanderbilt. Garrison was a loyal employee. At first, he refused to do so, but the more he thought about it and the more he thought about his partner, Charlie Morgan, thinking we could probably do this. Mm -hmm. Okay. What Garrison did was he sent his son to Nicaragua along with Mr. Randolph to negotiate with Walker over the terms for a new line. Once the son reached an agreement, he was to sail for New York to bring Morgan into the plot before it became public knowledge and accessory transit shares collapsed in the stock market. Well, Walker agreed to that plan. The two soon made a deal with Garrison's son. 
Morgan and Garrison would pay Randolph for the transit rights and start a new steamship and transit line. Walker would then seize the accessory transit riverboats and infrastructure and give them to the new partners. This new line would carry filibuster recruits from the U.S. for free, accumulating credits toward the cost of the property in Nicaragua. So Garrison's son rushes to New York to explain the arrangement to Morgan. As luck would have it, though, at that very moment, Morgan was being pushed out of the accessory transit company by Commodore Vanderbilt. Mm. Seems the two had battled over the company for three years. Vanderbilt had pretty much was done with it. By the end of 1855, he began to secretly buy control of the stock, so Morgan readily agreed to Randolph's plan and secretly prepared to start the new Nicaragua line. News of Walker's revocation of the charter hit Wall Street like a bombshell. Vanderbilt rushed to Washington to secure federal aid. However, the cabinet, as the nation itself at this time, remember this is the late 1850s, they were divided over whether Walker was a criminal or a hero. The South thought he was a hero. The North thought he was a criminal. Mm -hmm. So the Commodore sent a subordinate, his own set of mercenaries, to retake the company's steamships on the San Juan River. He counted on support from the British, who were hostile to filibustering and claimed a protectorate over the Atlantic coast of Nicaragua. The uh, Royal Navy stationed warships in the harbor of Greytown. Uh, However, the former accessory transit agent in charge of the boats refused to hand them over, and the British declined to intervene. Now, had Vanderbilt succeeded... Morgan and Garrison could not have opened their line. Walker would have been cut off, and Nicaragua would have gone back to the Nicaraguans. Instead, war. Yep. Yeah. Costa Rica in April 1856 invaded Nicaragua. Walker launched a frontal assault and was defeated. This thing with frontal assaults with him just did not work. No, it didn't sound too smart on his part. He almost was completely defeated, but a cholera outbreak forced the Costa Ricans to retreat, and Walker was able to get new recruits by way of that new steamship line. Patricio Rivas denounced him as an usurper and fled the country. Then Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala marched into Nicaragua from the north and occupied Leon on July 12th. At that point, Walker held an election naming himself as president. He declared English the official language. He legalized slavery, which is what he was planning on doing anyway. Costa Rica then comes back from the south, and the only territory that Walker was holding by that point was the transit route to keep Americans coming in. He burned Granada, burned it to the ground. Mm. Wow. Now, Vanderbilt at this point sent a man by the name of Sylvanus Spencer to Costa Rica to work with the Costa Ricans to seize the transit ships and cut off Walker They gave them $40,000 in gold for financing of this and a plan to do that. Spencer was put in charge of a commando force. He captured a filibuster stronghold and some steamboats. Then he captured all the ships up the San Juan River, leaving Walker isolated. At this point, Walker surrendered to an American naval officer just to get out of the country because if he was completely defeated, the Nicaraguans would have killed him right there. Mm-hmm. As a result of all this, Vanderbilt, even though he got the steamship line back and the transit line back, Nicaragua said, no, we're not going to, we're just shutting it down because we don't want any more crazy American filibusters coming in here and taking over our country. But you know what's interesting, Steve, is President Buchanan, you know, he wasn't a very, I guess, talkative type of president. He was always perceived as a very quiet, but kind of, I don't know, level-headed kind of president to some, but he said at one time, that man has done more injury to the commercial and political interests of the United States than any man living. Yeah, but the thing about it is, Rod, they loved him. They loved Walker in the U.S. Everywhere Mm -hmm. he went, he was greeted with throngs of admirers for being Mm -hmm. such a strong man, and that gave him the incentive to try it one more time. On November 25th, 1857, Walker landed at Greytown in Nicaragua with 270 followers. The U.S. Navy then, however, showed up and forced his surrender, took him back. 1860, he made his final attempt to invade Central America, 
British Navy captured him, though, and handed him over to the Honduran authorities who executed him by firing squad on September 12, 1860. Mm. To this day, the people of Latin America, particularly Central America, see William Walker as a symbol of American imperialism. And mm. that is why you can't say the name William Walker anywhere in Central America. Wow. And that's another story in the history of Appalachia. We appreciate you listening to the podcast. You can subscribe if you'd like to at iTunes or at Stitcher or at your favorite Android or Windows Phone podcast app. We're on Facebook. Please be sure to come by and like us. And we're also on Twitter. You can follow us at Story Appalachia. Till next time, take care and we'll see you. So long, everybody. 